Well, as we start this morning, I want you to picture in your head a hero of the faith. Could be someone from the Bible, could be from someone from church history, maybe even someone in your own life. But, but when you think of this person, you think, that is a man or that is a woman of faith. That's what Christian bravery looks like. That's what Christian courage looks like. This morning, we're returning again to the book of Judges, and we're given a portrait of a man who the book of Hebrews highlights as a man of faith. It says that this is a man of whom the world was not worthy. He's a hero of the faith. But when we look at the specifics of his story, it doesn't seem like it. In fact, the opposite seems true. He, he doubts God. He questions God. But what we'll find in our text today is that a true hero of the faith is not the person who never has doubts and never gets afraid, but rather the true hero of the faith is the one who gives those doubts and fears to God. If you were here last week or paying attention a few minutes ago, you know that we are looking at Gideon. And in our introduction of Gideon last week, we saw that the Israelites had once again, yet again, abandoned God. They forsook God and followed after the gods of the people and the lands, specifically the gods of Baal, Asherah. And because of that, God allowed the Midianites and some of their, their friends to come and ravage the land. And what they would do is every year around harvest time, they would come and they would take the crops, they would take the animals that were used um, for the harvesting, and then leave. And it was uh, something like uh, the grasshoppers in a bug's life, right? They would come, you do all the work all season, and we come in at the last minute and snatch up all the food. And this goes on for seven years. Finally, the Israelites wake up from their slumber and they cry out to God, God, help us. But God doesn't send a deliverer, not at first. First, he sends a prophet to give them his word. Because God wants the people to see that the greatest enemy the Israelites were facing were not these, these hordes that were coming in and taking their food. It wasn't these enemies that were coming in and taking their animals and their means of production. No, their greatest enemy was their own idolatrous hearts. And after God sends the prophet to give them that word, then he calls Gideon. Gideon, you are going to save Israel, and I'm going to be with you. But remember, Gideon didn't even know it was God who was talking to him. And so he puts forth this little test, right? He puts this offering together and says, all right, if you are really you, if you're really going to be talking to me, then, then I need some confirmation. And God does this. God sends fire to consume the offering and tells Gideon, yes, I am with you. But God doesn't stop there. God says, okay, Gideon, now I have a test for you. I want to see if you are really with me. You know those idols to Baal and Asherah that are in your dad's land? Tear them down. And Gideon does. We're going to pick up the story here this morning. God has already started to deliver the people by ridding them of their idolatry, or at least trying to rid them of their idolatry. Now it's time to clear out the Midianites. So we are in Judges chapter 6, verse 33. It says this, Now all the Midianites and the Amalekites, the people of the east, came together, and they crossed the Jordan and encamped at the valley of Jezreel. But... The Spirit of the Lord clothed Gideon, and he sounded the trumpet. And the Abiezrites, that that was his family, his clan, right? The Abiezrites were called out to follow him, and he sent messengers throughout all Manasseh. And they too were called out to follow him. And he sent messengers to Asher and Zebulun and Naphtali, and they went up to meet him. So, again, like the bug's life, right? It's time for the harvest. The people come steal the, to, to get the harvest of food, to steal the animals, and they're camped out in the valley ready to pounce. But, verse 34, the spirit of Yahweh clothed Gideon. And as a response, Gideon put out the call to his family, his clan, his tribe, the neighboring tribes, hey, guys, it's time to come defend the land But think about that phrase for a second. The spirit of Yahweh, the spirit of the Lord clothed Gideon. 
You see something like this throughout Scripture, and, and it's essentially God is coming together and, and putting his spirit like a, a coat around Gideon, surrounding Gideon, empowering him to do his will. And then there are others who say, well, this isn't so much God wrapping Gideon like a clo- cloak. Rather, it's God putting on Gideon like a glove, and God's about to do his work in the land, and he's going to use Gideon to do it. Either way, the, the point is the same. Gideon is going to have God's power and God's strength to do it. So he's good to go, right? I mean, you've been clothed by God. You've rallied the people. You've already got confirmation that God is going to let you do it and and use you to do it. What's next? Verse 36. Then Gideon said to God, if you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said, behold, I'm laying a fleece of wool on the threshing floor. If there's dew on the fleece alone, and it's dry all around on the ground, then I shall know that you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said. And it was so. When he rose early the next morning and squeezed the fleece, he wrung enough dew from the fleece to fill a bowl with water. Then Gideon said to God, Let not your anger burn against me. Let me speak just once more. Please, let me test just once more with the fleece. Please, let it be dry on the fleece only. And on all the ground, let there be dew. And God did so that night, and it was dry on the fleece only. And all around the ground was dew. In the passage we looked at last week, Gideon told God, I need to know that it's really you who's talking to me. I need some confirmation that you're really going to be with me. And so he put the test out, and God confirmed it. This passage is Gideon telling God, okay, you're with me. I got that. But are you really going to use me to save Israel? So first test, do on the fleece. The ground is dry. Yes, done. God confirms it. Second test, do on the ground. The fleece is dry, and it was so. God did it. Now, what do we do with that? I mean, isn't it a sin to test God? I mean, doesn't Deuteronomy 6 say, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test? That seems like that's what Gideon's doing here, right? And, And Gideon already had confirmation once. I mean, he himself says in verse 37, yeah, you've already told me you're you're doing this. He says that twice. As you have said, but show me one more time, and God does. And that's still not enough for Gideon. Okay, God, you, you've, you've proven it. You've shown me. You've told me. Just one more time. Because of this, most people are very quick to call Gideon out for his lack of faith. They'll say, don't be like Gideon. Don't doubt. I mean, sure, God used him, but, but he used Gideon in spite of his doubt. But I don't think that's the case. I don't think that's giving a fair reading to the scripture here. I don't think this is what's happening, and I don't think that's what the passage is teaching. I mean, yes, Gideon does have his doubts, but what did he do with those doubts? He took them to God. He gave them to God, and he was apologetic as he did it. Don't be angry with me. Remember this this, uh, distinction that I laid out last week. There is a massive difference between a skeptic saying, prove it, right? An unbeliever saying, oh, really? You're going to do this? That's not Gideon here. Gideon is saying, I believe, but help my unbelief. He may have had a tiny faith, but it was faith. And there's a few ways that we know this. That Gideon here is is not faithless. First, God's spirit is already on him and in him, right? God is already working in his life. This doesn't make Gideon sinless or faultless, but it's not insignificant. Second, and even more important, when Gideon asked God for confirmation, God gave it. God answered him three times already. But God didn't chastise him. God didn't berate him. He gave him yet another assurance that he was looking for. And and we really need to stop for a second and ask why. Why was God so affirming to Gideon? 
Why did God put up with Gideon's doubts? I mean, surely in all of Israel, with all of his people, God could have found one person with more faith than Gideon. Surely he could have found one person who didn't have the doubts that Gideon had. And yet, not only does God answer these tests, Gideon is known as a man of faith. Well, to be able to answer these questions and to see why and how this happens, we need to keep going. So we're in chapter 7 now, verse 1. Remember, Gideon was renamed after he tore down the altars of Baal. He was renamed Jerob Baal, which means fights with Baal, contends with Baal, or let, let Baal contend for himself. So we'll see those names back and forth here. But look at chapter 7, verse 1. Then Jerob Baal, that is Gideon, and all the people who were with him, rose early and encamped beside the spring of Herod. And the camp of Midian was north of them by the hill of Morah in the valley. The Lord said to Gideon, The people with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hand, lest Israel boast over me, saying, My own hand, save me. Now therefore, proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whoever is fearful and trembling, let him return home and hurry away from Mount Gilead. Then, 22,000 of the people returned, and 10,000 remained. And the Lord, uh, the Lord said to Gideon, The people are still too many. Take them down to the water, and I will test them for you there. And, and any one of whom I say to you, This one shall go with you, shall go with you. And any one of whom I say, This one shall not go with you, shall not go with you. So he brought the people down to the water, and the Lord said to Gideon, Everyone who laps the water with his tongue as a dog laps, you shall set by himself. Likewise, everyone who kneels down to drink. And the number of those people, the number of those who lapped, putting their hands to their mouths, was 300 men. But all the rest of the people knelt down to drink water. And the Lord said to Gideon, With the three hundred who lapped, I will save you and give the Midianites into your hand, and let all the others go, every man to his home. So the people took provisions in their hands and their trumpets, and he sent all the rest of Israel, every man to his tent, but retained the three hundred men. And the camp of Midian was below him in the valley. This is one of the most memorable and famous scenes in all of the Bible. It starts with this incredible observation in verse 2. Gideon, you have too many people. <laughs> I can't save Israel with an army this big. Isn't that ridiculous? Now, when God says this, we know that he doesn't mean he doesn't really have the power to save Israel, right? My God is so big, so strong, and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do, right? But we see God use armies much bigger than this throughout the Old Testament, right? God saves his people. He can do anything that he wants. No, God's warning here is that if he uses this army of 32,000 men, what will happen? The army's going to boast. Look what we did. We beat Midian. We freed our people. We overpowered them. We're better than them. And that's what God wants to avoid, so God says to Gideon, if I'm going to use you, we have to thin the army. So first step, who's afraid? You guys go home, right? Y'all are done. Go in peace. It's all good. And 22,000 of them left. 68% of his army, pff, gone. And then God says, no, 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 still too many. Still too many. We, we need to narrow it down some more. And so they have this, this drink test, right? The kneelers go home. Those who lap up the water with their hands and their tongues, um, they're the ones who, who get to stay. Now, there's a lot of stuff in all the commentaries about why this happens and what the, the lapping versus the kneeling means. I, I saw one commentary say, well, those who knelt down were careless. They, they weren't real soldiers because the real soldier stays alert all the time, doesn't get in a comfortable position, right? And then I saw another commentary say the exact opposite, that, oh, no, no, it was the kneelers who were the true soldiers, and that's why they were sent home, because God didn't want to use real soldiers. Now, I have no idea whether either of those distinctions are true or not, but there's no way to know it from the text, right? And so we want to be able to draw the lessons from the text that God wants us to learn. We, we need to be careful about taking something outside and putting it in to create a meaning that isn't there. And so I think it's best to stick with a plain reading of the text, which is simply God wanted to narrow down the army, and this is the method that he chose. 
So you kneel down to drink, bye-bye, you're gone. And as always, God got his way. So 32,000 down to 10,000, 10,000 down to 300. So track where we are. God proved to Gideon, I'm with you. I'm really going to use you. Then God proved to Gideon twice, I'm really going to give you the victory. Then God spoke directly to Gideon, let's get your army ready. Here's your fighting force. With all of that in mind, let's see what happens next in verse 9. That same night, the Lord said to him, Arise and go down into the camp, for I have given it into your hand. But if you are afraid to go down, go down to the camp with Pura, your servant. And you shall hear what they say, and afterwards your hand shall be strengthened to go down against the camp. Then he went down to Pura, his servant, to the outposts of the armed men who were in the camp. And the Midianites and the Malachites and all the people of the east lay along the valley like locusts in abundance. And their camels were without number, as the sand that is on the seashore in abundance. When Gideon came, behold, a man was telling a dream to his comrade, and he said, Behold, I dreamed a dream, and behold, a cake of barley bread tumbled into the camp of Midian and came into the tent and struck it so that it fell and turned it upside down so that the tent lay flat. And his comrade answered, This is no other than the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel. God has given into his hand Midian and all the camp. I love this. It's not Gideon testing God. It's not Gideon saying, hey, God, I need one more test. God is the initiator here and says, all right, Gideon, you need further confirmation. If you're still scared, I have more for you. Go into the camp. But you don't have to go alone. Go ahead and take your servant with you. And just listen. When you get there, just listen. God knows that Gideon is still afraid. And again, God doesn't mock him for it. He, he doesn't say, he doesn't lose his temper and say, come on now, Gideon, isn't four tests enough? Really? You need more? No, God doesn't do that. God comforts him. And we see this was God's plan all along because as Gideon and the servant sneak into the camp, they overhear this guy saying, dude, I had the weirdest dream. This like cake came in and destroyed the camp. And his friend's like, uh-oh, this, we're, we're getting destroyed. And in all of this, God shows himself to be sovereign. I mean, think about it. This guy having a dream, first of all, God gave him the dream. Second of all, this guy has the, the desire to tell the dream to his friend, and Gideon just happens to be sent and arrive there at just the right time to hear what's going on. God was working in all of this. God's hand was moving and arranging all of these things. And now, with another confirmation in his pocket, Gideon's ready. He goes back to the camp, organizes his troops. Let's see what he says, verse 15. And as soon as Gideon heard the telling of the dream and its interpretation, he worshipped. And he returned to the camp of Israel and said, Arise, for the Lord has given the host of Midian into your hand. And, and he divided the 300 men into three companies and put trumpets into the hands of all of them and empty jars with torches inside the jars. And he said to them, Look at me and do likewise. When I come to the outskirts of the camp, do as I do. When I blow the trumpet, I and all who are with me then blow the trumpets. Also on every side of all the camp and shout for the Lord and for Gideon. This is so good. Right? Gideon splits his army up into companies of 100 each, three, three companies of 100 each, and says, all right, we're going to surround the camp. Now just picture that in your head. What does the enemy force look like? Like locusts that are covering the valley. Camels can't even number them. You put them all together, Gideon doesn't say, or God doesn't say, oh yeah, it's like the sand. No, no, he says it's like the sand of the shore. Not just the sand of the shore, but the sand of the shore in abundance. This is a lot of people. So they're spread out. When these 300 men broken up into 300, uh, three different um, groups, when they surround the camp, it's not like, oh yeah, this size, this room, you know, yeah, we could easily fit that. No, no, no. They're spread out. 
And what weapons are they given? Trumpets, jars, and torches. I mean, if I'm planning this, I'm thinking at least a bow and arrow, right? Maybe flaming arrows, that would be helpful. No, he gets trumpets, jars, and torches. Oh, and, and their voices, right? They're told, they're given this command, when it's time, you yell for the Lord and for Gideon. So let's see what happens. Verse 19. So Gideon and the hundred men who were with him came to the outskirts of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch, when they had just set watch. And they blew the trumpets and smashed the jars that were in their hands. Then the three companies blew their trumpets and broke the jars. They held in their left hand the torches and in their right hand the trumpets to blow. And they cried out, a sword for the Lord and for Gideon. Every man stood in his place around the camp and all the army ran. They cried out and fled. When they blew the 300 trumpets, the Lord set every man's sword against his comrade and against all the army. And the army fled as far as Beth Shittah toward Zerara, as far as the border of Abel Mahola by Tabath. And all the men of Israel were called out from Naphtali and from Asher and from all Manasseh, and they pursued after Midian. So the battle goes off almost exactly as planned. Jars smashed, torches lit, trumpets blaring, and the people yell out, a sword for Yahweh, for the Lord, and for Gideon. That's a small difference there, right? Gideon says, hey, you shout out for the Lord and for Gideon, but what did they actually shout out? A sword for the Lord and Gideon? I don't know if there's any significance in that, but what happens next is awesome. I don't know if they just shouted once, or if they would alternate shouts and trumpets, shouts and trumpet. But either way, they shout, they blow the trumpet, they break the jars, and then they just stand there and watch. They didn't actually fight. They didn't need any weapons. God sent the enemy into a panic, and they start attacking each other and run away. God fought the battle. He used 300 men armed with trumpets and jars to put a massive army to flight. Now, Israel does pursue him, right? Pursue them. Um, and we'll find out what happens next week. But I want to stop here so we can go back to the questions that I asked earlier. When God was picking out who is going to deliver my people, why couldn't he get someone else? Why did he pick Gideon? The man who would need confirmation after confirmation after confirmation. The man who would test God again and again and again. The man who was fearful. The man who was doubting. Why did God use him? And even more so, how can this man Gideon be considered a hero of the faith? Again, Hebrews 11, that's where I'm getting that from. His name is mentioned. This is someone to emulate. But he doesn't look like it. I mean, this isn't Moses, you know, facing Pharaoh in the court with the Egyptians surrounding a let my people go right now. This isn't David in the face of Goliath and the Philistines, a boy with a slingshot, right? Hey, God's going to do this. God's going to give the victory. This is more like, uh, wait, what, what did you say? Me? Really? No, surely not me. Uh, I, I don't know. Right? That's Gideon. But that's why this passage is so important. Important, Because Judges 6 and 7 gives us a particular picture of a biblical truth that is made explicit later. It gives a portrait of a truth that is explicit later. I've already mentioned it a couple times. Hebrews 11. So let's flip over there together. So we're in, um, I don't know, maybe a fourth of the way through the Old Testament. Let's flip over maybe to uh, a fourth left in the New Testament, right? Toward the end of the New Testament, the book of Hebrews, I want to look at chapter 11. And I want to start in verse 32. And while you're flipping there, what we see in Hebrews 11 is, is sometimes considered the hall of faith, right? You have Abel and Enoch and Noah and Abraham and Moses. And, and it mentions them and it goes through specific things in their lives of why they're commended for their faith. So let's look at verse 32 and see what it says. And what more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, there he is, of Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets who through faith conquered kingdoms, 
enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the, fire, uh, the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Did you catch it? One little phrase that looks weird in there. Verse 34, these heroes of the faith were those who were made strong out of weakness. This event in Gideon's life in Judges 6 and 7 teaches us that heroic faith, commendable faith, is not found in the person who never has any fears, who never has any doubts. The hero of the faith is not the person who has all the answers and knows what to do. Heroic biblical faith is an embracing of your weaknesses so that the power of God might be more clearly seen in your life. Gideon was a hero of the faith, not because he didn't have weaknesses, but because he took those weaknesses to God. He was a, a hero of the faith, not because he had doubts, but because he took those doubts to God. Fear and doubt will come into your life. And if not, you just haven't lived long enough. But fear and doubt will come. And so many of us walk around weighed down because we know that Jesus says, do not fear. But when Jesus tells us, do not fear, he does not mean don't have a reaction or feelings of fear. What he means is do not give in to that fear. Do not give in to those feelings. I mean, think about another hero of the faith, King David. What does he say in Psalm 56? When I am afraid, so he's afraid, right? Psalm 56 verse 3, when I am afraid, I put my trust in you. In God, whose word I praise, in you I trust, I will not be afraid. So what David says in Psalm 56 is, hey, when I'm afraid, I'm not going to be afraid. How do you do that? You don't give yourself over to the fear. It's when you give yourself over to your doubts and give yourself over to fear and let them control, that's when it becomes sinful. That's when you're lacking faith. Well, let me say it this way. The existence of fear and doubt in your life, those things don't determine the amount of your faith. What you do with those fears and what you do with those doubts determine the amount of your faith. And so if you, like Gideon, take them to God and say, here, I have these. What do I do with them? Help. That's exercising faith. That's what faith is. And back to Hebrews 11, you don't have to flip there, but Hebrews 11, 1, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen, which means you can't see the outcome. You don't know what's going to happen. And yet, in that uncertainty, you have this hope and you have this conviction that God really is in control and he really is going to help. And so in that hope, you flee to God. I mean, the, you look at Judges 6 and 7, and the whole point is not Gideon delivered the people, it's that God delivered the people through Gideon. God used a weak man like Gideon to get the job done. Up against a massive army that's already beat you seven years in a row, well, God will take 300 men armed with torches and jars not because it's unexpected, but because it's impossible. And why did Gideon go along with it? Because his faith was made strong in weakness. And this isn't isolated to Gideon. This is for us. Some things in the New Testament, you look at those and you're like, ooh, I don't know what to do with that. This has a direct correlation to us in the New Testament. It's a mantra that we can adopt as Christians the Apostle Paul, 2 Corinthians 12, what does he say? He, he's questioning God. God, I want you to take this weakness that I have. I, I want you to take it away. I, I have this horrible weakness in my life. I don't want it. I need you to take it. But God says to him, this is 2 Corinthians 12, my grace is sufficient for you. And my power is made perfect in weakness. So Paul says, Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest on me. It's for the sake of Christ then that I'm content. 
I'm happy. I'm okay with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. See, what happens is most of the time Christians have no problem when it comes to their salvation admitting that they're weak. And that's what a Christian is, right? A Christian is, is one who says, I couldn't save myself. Uh, when I was weak, that's when Christ died for me. I was dead in sin. God saved me. No problem with that, right? I'm weak. I need to be saved. God saved me. But when it comes to their daily lives, after they become believers, they give in to their weaknesses. They say things like, gosh, I would really love to evangelize, but, but gosh, I just I don't have the boldness to do it. I, I don't have the, the faith to do it. And so they don't. They give up. They give in to the fear. Or, man, I really wish I could, I could read my Bible more. I wish I could pray more, but I just don't have the discipline to do it. I'm not that strong in the faith. And so they don't. They give up. Or take any other issue that you're facing in your life, raising your kids according to Scripture, dealing with your finances, if there's strife in your home. Maybe you personally are having doubts of whether or not the Bible is true. We let these issues dominate our minds, and then when that happens, we simply give up. And so with our kids, we settle for some sort of pop psychology type of parenting. Or, or with our finances, we happily go into debt and we don't really care that much about it. Or in our marriage, when there's issues, we turn to bitterness and anger. Or when we're doubting the Bible, we, we simply give up the clear teachings of Scripture, either saying, well, I'm obviously not a good Christian, or God must not care if he's real at all. But Scripture doesn't teach us that, yes, we're saved in our weaknesses, but after salvation, you have to be strong on your own. Scripture teaches the opposite. We're saved in weakness, and then we continue in our weakness. Why? To show that the power in your life belongs to God and to God alone. It's when we boast in our weakness, Paul says, that Christ's power is most fully realized in our lives. But in order for that to happen, we have to have the faith of Gideon. We have to be like him. He doubted. He took his doubts to God. He needed assurance. He asked God for assurance. When God offered him additional confirmation, he was not too proud to take it. Embracing your weakness does not mean that you give in to it and let it take control. Embracing your weaknesses means that you grab a hold of them and then you give them to God. That's what Gideon did. God, here's my weaknesses. And then, acknowledging those weaknesses, being clothed in God's spirit, he obeyed. So, evangelism. I don't have the faith to speak. I don't have the boldness to speak. So you tell God that. God, I know that person needs to hear about Jesus, and I have no clue what to say to him. But I'm going, I'm going to go talk anyways. And you know what? You may fumble all over your words. <laughs> and you may think, oh man, what am I going to do now? This person thinks I'm an idiot. How are they going to love Jesus? God loves to use idiots to save unbelievers. God loves to use our weakness to save people. That way they're not saying, well, I'm going to come to Jesus because you're such a good speaker. Because if they come to Jesus because you're a good speaker, then they'll leave Jesus as soon as a better speaker comes along. But if they come because you say, look, I don't really know the answers, but here's what God's word says about us and about sin and about life and about who he is and about who you are. And I don't have all the answers, but I'm just telling you what the Bible says. God uses that. Or with your kids. If you, if you think, gosh, I don't know what to do with this. I don't understand what my kids are doing. They're like, they're like aliens now, and I don't, I don't know what to say, and everything's turning into a fight, into an argument, and, and I don't know what to do. Own that and go to God and say, God, I don't know what to do. I need help here. I need some, some practical assurance. I want to see my kids saved. I want to see them happy. I want to see them holy. I want to see them depend on you. I don't know what to do. And then you go do it anyways because you know that God's spirit will help you. If you have doubts about something in the Bible or about something about who God is, take them to God and say, God, I don't, I don't know if I believe this. I don't understand Help me. Why would you leave God to go talk to some guy with a degree in order to get answers about who God is? 
No. And degrees aren't bad, by the way. I have many. But, but why would we leave God to question God? Go to him. He has answers for every question you may have. God will never once be stumped by an issue that you have. He'll never once say, I don't know about that. God has answers. Whether it's finances. Man, we're, we're so much into debt already, and I know God tells us to tithe something. I don't know, but... Uh, well, while we're thinking about this, why don't we go on another vacation we can't afford, right? No, don't do that. Instead, say, okay... God doesn't want me to be in debt. God wants me to give money to the, to the kingdom work, whatever that looks like. So I'm going to obey. I, I don't know what that means for, for food next month. Maybe it'll teach my kids to love bologna sandwiches. I don't know, but, but I'm going forward in faith. Right? With all of these things, think about Gideon. He didn't storm the battlefield to prove his bravery and his worth and his faith. He stood on the side and yelled and broke some jars and blew a trumpet. And God did the fighting for him. And we're called to do the same. We're called to do the same. I don't have the power, God. I don't have the courage. I don't have the strength to get through this heartache or this issue with the kids or or trouble with my spouse or this emotional valley that I'm in. I can't seem to get control of my own feelings or, or in this loss or in this death. God, I don't have the strength Take it to God. Take it to God and tell him, just as you saved me when I was weak, sustain me while I am weak. Give me the strength to endure, and he will. God loves to use our weaknesses and troubles and our doubts to display his strength in our lives. And so you may be feeling like, gosh, God is pairing me. He's thinning me. He's he's taking away every comfort and every resource that I have. And God may be preparing you to use you like he used Gideon. So take your things to him in faith.